decades. We are looking at what works in treatment and prevention. This is part one of a three-part webinar series, and you can see that at the bottom of the slide. This is March 30th. Therefore, part two of this web event will take place on April the 6th, and part three of this web address, uh, a web event will take place on April 13th at 1 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. So that's your, uh, your information to tie into the second one. Okay. I would now like to give you some information about the context and how this particular webinar was developed. This is a collaborative effort. It's a collaboration between the Bureau of Justice Assistance, and we will refer to them as BJA throughout the presentation, American University, we will refer to American University as AU, and the National Development and Research Institutes which we will refer to as NDRI. Now, BJA provides a host of assistance to grantees of BJA uh, contracts. Now, BJA contracted with American University to provide this technical assistance to courts in the field. One of the things that AU did if they're going to be providing technical assistance, have to do a needs assessment. What does the field need? What are courts struggling with? And as a result of that needs assessment, three webinars have been developed. One on co-occurring disorders, which was hosted by Paul Warren, that some of you who are sitting out there now sat through some three weeks ago. The second webinar is on cultural proficiency. And there will be another webinar when we conclude this trilogy on working with 18 to 25-year-olds. For those of you who are banging your head against the wall working with 18 to 25-year-olds, don't take it personal. Take a number. Everyone is having problems with 18 to 25-year-olds. It's a very difficult age bracket. So we'll examine who are these individuals and what interventions might work with them. So. The National Development and Research Institutes, as I shared with you earlier, we're a behavioral science research and training organization. What the Training Institute does, we disseminate research findings, and we train the workforce in skills. We enhance their skill levels with, as a result of the research that has been done. We train courses like, I'll give you a few titles, assessment interviewing. We have to assess everyone who comes through drug court, everyone who comes through treatment, so that we can make good treatment matches. We also train courses like group facilitation. In the business that we're in, we do group to death. We have all sorts of groups, and you can really do more harm than good if you don't know what you're doing. So it would behoove you, you folks who are essentially using group as an intervention, to have people who have been well trained. Uh, and lastly, another course that we will train at the Training Institute here, motivational interviewing, evidence-based. We want to share motivational interviewing with the field because it's been proven to work. Well, we're a behavioral uh, science research and training organization. Let me just say this. Everyone within earshot of this webinar is a behavioralist. You're working, no matter what your title is, could be judge, could be case manager, could be peer uh, educator, could be probation officer, could be police officer. Everyone is a behavioralist. You're working with individuals who are uh, exhibiting risky behavior, and what you'd like to do is move them down the continuum so they can exhibit less risky behavior. Eliciting behavior change is difficult, so we don't want you to waste your time on interventions that have been proven not to work. Now, being that this is a collaborative effort, we're concerned about behavior, and we're going to be sharing with you some things that you can put in place in your court to essentially enhance behavior modification. On this slide, 
In the left-hand column, you see the disciplines that make up behavioral science. Behavioral science is a collection of a number of different disciplines. Uh, recently, or not too recently, I see that you can now get a degree in behavioral science. You couldn't always do that. You either had to get a psychology degree or a sociology degree or an anthropology degree, but now you can get a degree in behavioral science. So we have the, the domains of behavioral science listed out there in the left-hand column. The right-hand column has some of the components of drug court that pretty much mirror the disciplines of behavioral science. We have evaluation, treatment, and you see there I have court and treatment twice, one for sociology and one for anthropology. Let me just share with you where I'm going with this. The disciplines of behavioral science, the first one I'll talk about, epidemiology. We have a lot of epidemiologists working here at NDRI because we're a behavioral science research outfit. Well, what do they do? I call them my bean counters. Okay, they collect data. They make comparisons. Uh, uh, they look. They establish prevalence rates. How many individuals out of a thousand are at risk for developing this particular condition or become engaged with this particular drug? That is important information to pass on to policymakers, to treatment providers, so they know what to anticipate that's going to be coming down the road. An example of an epidemiological study that we've been involved with, the DAWN study, that's D-A-W-N, that's Drug Alert Warning Network, was a 12-city study, went on for quite some time comparing drug use patterns throughout the country. The East Coast is different from the West Coast, which is different from the Midwest, which is different from the South. All the patterns are not alike. They're different, and we need to advise individuals who are working in the field of this is what you need to look for. Why should you be testing for a drug that people are not using in your region? You don't have money to waste and BJA would be glad to know that you're thinking in that particular manner. Okay? Well, on the drug court side, what is the parallel to epidemiology? Evaluation. I am so enthused when I see researchers or evaluators attending training. Most of the time we don't get the researcher or the evaluator in training, but they are a critical component in the drug court. They can essentially establish systems so that you know what works on who. Who are you doing a bad job with? Who are you doing a good job with? This will become infinitely more important as we start to get more information from the latest census that was just conducted. People are moving around the country. Migration patterns are different. No longer are we seeing people come from the south to the urban north. We're seeing the reverse. They're moving from the urban north because of the economy issues. They're moving to the south. They feel that they can raise their children in a safer environment. They can get educated there. So we're starting to see population shifts. So if you have been involved in drug court for some time, perhaps you got used to a certain type of diversity amongst the participants in your court. Well, guess what? That's going to change. Therefore, you're going to have to become more culturally proficient to meet the needs of this new crop of individuals who may be accessing your court. So that's epidemiology and evaluation. Psychology is also an important component of the behavioral sciences because obviously a person's mental status has a lot to do with the behavior they're exhibiting at that particular point in time and their ability to alter or change that particular behavior. I want to share with you a case example uh, from years ago. I used to direct the day treatment program for the New York City Department of Probation that pretty much mirrored drug court. It operated pretty much as drug court does now. Instead of having a judge, I had a commissioner that I had to report to. That was one of the differences. We are sitting around, the treatment staff, the probation staff, we're talking about cases, we're having a case conference. We're talking about one particular young man 
we go around the table, check in with the drug treatment provider who says, this young man is a model at morning meeting. He's such a positive influence that we're thinking about hiring him as a junior counselor when he gets off probation. I said, oh, well, that, that sounds pretty good. Keep going around the table, get more glowing reports. I, I hear from the educational provider. And what do they say? They say, you know, this particular young man is going to take the GED exam next week. We know he's going to pass because he really did well on the predictor examination. And not only that, he's tutoring other guys in the class. I said, well, that's pretty positive. I'm glad to hear that keep going around the table, get more glowing reports until I get to the probation officer. And what's the probation officer do? Pulls out the latest urine report that indicates the young man tested positive for marijuana. And the probation officer is saying he's violated the conditions of his probation, therefore he goes back to Rikers Island. Now I have a problem because the problem is, in my mind is, how do you define success? Should I take into consideration these other reports that I'm getting about his behavior, which are very positive, or should I go with the probation officer who's going on pass-fail? It's either true-false, he's clean or he's dirty, case closed. Those are the conditions of his probation. I realize that I need some more information. Things are just not making sense. I then request a psychiatric evaluation. I make an appointment for him took me about a week to do that. I send him up to Columbia Presbyterian. He goes, the psychologist runs whatever screening tests uh, that they had available at that particular point in time, and the young man uh, uh, is then diagnosed. They then write up the report, they get it back to me. The whole process took about a month. When I get the report back, the psychologist is being very specific. They're saying, in this particular case, and only this case, marijuana medicates for this young man's schizophrenia. Wow, we had no idea that this was occurring. So we were able to get the young man on a med that the PO could live with. It was a success story. He graduates the program, moves down the yellow brick road, graduates. We don't see him anymore. We're giving each other high fives at probation, saying, boy, we're doing quality work here, when in fact, we got lucky. But what that told us was that it's very important to have your mental health treatment component in place. And that goes to whether or not you have a mental health court or whether you have an adult drug court. You need access to mental health services. So the drug court is concerned about treatment there, mental health treatment in that particular case. How about sociology? What do sociologists study? Well, they study the effect of environment on behavior. And when people come to our programs or they, when we're intaking them in drug court, we ask some very poignant questions. We ask questions like, anybody in your family on medication? Anybody institutionalized? Anybody in prison? That's going to, those types of questions are going to give us a snapshot of who's sitting in front of us. It's not going to tell us the whole story, but it's a starting point. So we need to be concerned about their environment in behavioral science. And you know what? When, <coughs> excuse me, when we flip to the, to the court side of the fence, the court is also concerned with environment. What do we do with drug court? We make home visits. We check on curfew. We want to make sure that the environment is not conducive to using drugs. Treatment people are also very much concerned with environment. We want to occupy people's leisure time. So we want to make sure they're going to groups, they're going to uh, uh, NA, AA. Again, we want the environment to be a healthy, positive environment, not necessarily an environment that they have been involved with in the past. So sociology, an important part of behavioral science, and an important component in drug court. And lastly, you see there, anthropology. Now, what do anthropologists study? Well, culture is one thing that anthropologists uh, study there, because culture influences behavior. And that's something also that the court uh, and treatment programs are very much concerned about. 
let's take the example of home visits. Now we know that the court sends people to the home to do a home visit, just to check on the home. Well, suppose this individual is from a culture that does not, that frowns on men being alone with women in their house. Well, we don't want to step on cultural toes, because if we step on cultural toes, you know what's going to happen? That person's going to leave the program, because you've disrespected their culture. Okay, so we don't want to do that. How about the treatment folks? What about culture concerns them? Well, how about their attitude toward women? In some cultures, and again, we have a lot of people coming from all over the planet Earth coming to this country. What about their attitude toward women and children? In some cultures, women and children are considered property, and the men can do whatever the hell they want to do with them. Now, here, you can't do that. So we, there may be an education component that needs to take place to advise individuals who come from those cultures, this is how you stay out of trouble here in the States. So there are a number of commonalities between behavioral science in the research arena and behavioral science in the drug court arena. What I'd like to do now, I'd like to have my colleague, Diana Padilla, launch a poll. And I'd like that poll, I'd like you guys to answer that poll in this respect. I'd like to know, of the treatment providers that you have available to refer people to, how many of you sitting out there have one to three substance abuse and mental health providers? How many of you have three to six substance abuse or mental health providers? Or how many of you have six plus mental health substance abuse providers? And Diana's going to put that up. Just check yes next to the, uh, the designated uh, area that you your court falls into. I want to get an idea of how much choice do you have when referring participants for services. And we'll give you a minute to do that. Okay, we're going to give you another 30 seconds. Okay, now I'm getting a sneak preview here. Oh, it changed drastically. Okay, you got another 15 seconds, folks. Let's get those uh, votes in now. Okay, according, and our, uh, Diana, you can close that poll. And if possible, can uh, we share that with the, uh, the group? Fantastic. I see that 50% of you have one to three providers to choose from. Another 50% have three to six providers to choose from. And none of you have six or more to choose from. I was hoping that you might get, we might get some who had six or more, because in our business we call those folks the educated consumers. You have to be able to choose the most appropriate program intervention for that particular client or that particular participant. And the more information you have about the individual, the better off it's going to be. Okay, so now I know that most of you, half of you have one to three, Providers in mental health and substance abuse, and another half, 50% of you have three to six providers to choose from. Okay, thank you very much for participating there. Okay. Now, why cultural proficiency? Well, first of all, let's just talk about the wording. Many of you have probably been to a cultural competency uh, a training session. Uh, why did we choose to use the word proficiency? Because that's the difference between the two. When you are culturally competent, we're referring to your individual skills. Proficiency is it's embedded in the protocol of the organization, the agency, 
that is basically employing the case managers who are working in the field. So proficiency is something that's institutionalized. Competency is your personal skill level. What I'd like to, uh, I would like to use an Iraqi war term to make the point. I'd like cultural proficiency, or we would like cultural proficiency to be embedded in the protocols of your drug court. And we're going to share with you how to do that. Okay, and what we're going to find out is that you're doing some of these things already. It's just not, you're just not connecting it or the information isn't getting passed from one end of the program to the other. But again, I will repeat this probably uh, three more times. The more information you have about an individual, the better off you're going to be in pulling off behavior change. Behavior change is difficult. You want as much information as possible on the individual. You do not want to essentially be groping in the dark. Okay, well, why cultural proficiency? What do we hope will happen? Well, we hope as a result of this new dialogue that we're going to have between participant and staff, we're going to have higher retention rates. We're going to hold on to people longer. Now, think about it those of you who have been working drug court for a while now, when do people split the program? They, you, they don't wait around for eight months to split the program. They split in the first three months. They're gone. So if we step on any cultural toes, that's very likely to happen. They're going to leave the program. As a result of us holding on to people longer, we'll have higher graduation rates. People will be around longer, therefore our graduation rates will go up, and we will also have, as a result of this new communication back and forth, enhanced quality insurance. We will be able to glean information from our participants that we can use to better the program, to meet their needs. Remember, that's what the program has to do. Those are our customers. We have to essentially enhance the quality of what we do. If your program is exactly the same today as it was three years ago, something's wrong. Because your uh, participant population has changed, your providers have changed, the world has changed, and guess what? You're going to have to change a little bit also in order to affect that behavior change. And the last bullet we see there is lower attrition rates. We're going to lose less people because we're going to be culturally proficient and people will get connected to essentially what we're doing and are not likely to leave the program. Okay, now that's why cultural proficiency. Now, how do we pull this off? How do we essentially get these results? Well, this particular slide is going to tell us how. In general, what we want to do by becoming culturally proficient, we're going to enhance our observation skills, and we're going to enhance our assessment skills. And how do we do that? We're going to be doing cultural assessments, both on the participants of the individuals in our drug court program and of the providers that we essentially refer them to. Those three to six providers that many of you have, okay, we want to make good matches. You're going to have to, you, you, you may have, uh, five providers. Which one do you choose for that particular participant? You have to know something about the participant. You have to know something about the provider to indicate that that would be a good match. Okay, now to assist you in that endeavor, after the third webinar on cultural proficiency, we're going to attach to our uh, NDRI library. Uh, I will let you know where you can find it. We have an instrument that has a list of questions that need to be asked of participants. And what I'm going to be encouraging teams to do is sit down, court people, treatment people, sit down together and determine who's the best person to ask this question. It may be a treatment provider. It may be a particular group in the treatment provider program. It may be a group that the probation officers run, but who's the best person to ask that question? We have sample questions. It's a rough cut, but that's intentional because every court is different. 
and you know what works in your court and you know who's the good questioner. We have some people who are excellent assessors and others who are maybe not so good assessors. They have other talents. So we're going to list that. We then have a provider assessment tool that we will discuss on the third delivery. We will go over that. We have a number of questions that you need to ask not only of your drug court, but also of the providers that you are sending your participants to. And by doing so, you'll know a little bit more about, is that going to be a good match? Can this particular program accommodate all the needs of this particular participant? Sometimes you don't have that choice. You just have to make the best possible choice. But nevertheless, that's what we're going to attempt to assist you with. The next bullet that you see there is treatment matching. And as I just said, we'll be able to do treatment matching better than we do it now. We are improving because we know more about the provider and we'll know more about the participant just to see, is it appropriate? Does this stand a chance of working? So we'll be uh, doing better treatment matching. The next bullet that you see there, incentives and sanctions. Every court has a list of incentives and sanctions, and as I've traveled throughout the country, very often those are short lists. What I would love for you guys to do would be to lengthen those lists. And I'm just going to give you an example of two, one incentive and one sanction that I was shared with me as I traveled around the country visiting some drug courts. I'll give you an a culturally proficient incentive. And I call this one the Big Mama Incentive. Now, when I was working in treatment, I would dedicate a day for my female clients to bring in their children. I wanted to see the kids. I wanted to see were there any special needs that needed to be addressed, because that can be very hard on a parent who's in recovery. Many needs, uh, that they don't need that kind of stress. So I wanted to see them. There was an eight-year-old that came in, had on a lovely leather jacket, and I said, did your mother buy you that jacket? The eight-year-old looked at me and said, no, my mother didn't buy the jacket. Big Mama bought the jacket. Now, who's Big Mama? That's what this child called Grandma. Grandma's Big Mama. Okay? Now, in this particular court that I was involved with, what happened was that the young lady is going from phase one to phase two. The court wanted to acknowledge the hard work that she put in. They wanted to reward her with an incentive. And they were thinking of getting her a voucher to get a pedicure and a manicure. Sounds real good. However, when it came time to give up the incentive, they did not give the incentive to the participant in the program. They gave the incentive to Big Mama, to Grandma. Why? Grandma was providing child care services. She took care of the kid while the participant in our drug court program made all the referrals that we had set up for her so she could get out of phase one and move on to phase two. And we wanted to acknowledge the assistance that Grandma was giving because if Grandma did not provide child care services, this young lady would have dropped out of the program because she's a mom first. She's going to make sure her child is safe. She has to be comfortable with the provider. If that doesn't happen, she's not going to make drops. She's going to miss court dates, and you know where the story goes from there. So that's a very interesting incentive. It does not go to the participant, but it goes to the participant's mother who's providing child care services, and we wanted that to continue. Well, okay, how about sanctions? Do, you have an ex do I have an example of a culturally proficient sanction? Well, you know I do. I ask the question. I'm not going to ask a question uh, about something I don't have. Okay, so one young lady, she was a participant in the drug court program and had been a member of the state girls' championship softball team. She loved playing softball. She played softball on the weekends. That, was, that occupied the majority of her time. Well, 
she missed a drop, she missed a court date. The court people get together and say, you know, we need to sanction her because she has to take these uh, appointments seriously. So what can we do? They say, well, we have to find something. We have, we'll find a community service that she can do on the weekend so that she can't play softball. And that way, this will really have some, this sanction will have some bite to it. She'll get the point that it's very important for her to make the court date, very important for her to make the, uh, the drop. Well, they find a community service uh, assignment for her at the women's clinic, answering the 800 line on the weekend. Now, little did the, the uh, drug court staff know, this young lady had OBGYN problems. When she went to volunteer on the weekend at the women's clinic, she met other women who had similar issues. She found out as a result of dialoguing with them how she could get those issues resolved. She got the issues resolved. She was very, very grateful for that. And the situation worked out so well that the women's clinic offered her a job. Now remember, this all started out with a sanction. You start out with a sanction and you wind up with a job, not bad. I really like that one for its creativity and for the outcome. So we, by becoming more culturally proficient, we will have different types of incentives and sanctions that the individual can essentially elicit that behavior change. They can move forward. They get the point, and maybe something good will happen. The next bullet you see there, I have listed as positive referrals. I could have said no blind referrals, and very often we do that in this business. We send people to a lot of referral agencies for all sorts of services. Very often we don't prepare them for what's about to greet them. And I'm going to share with you how I shot myself in the foot years ago. Had a young man. I wanted to send him to what they called at that time a TAP center, testing, assessment, and placement. It was a job training uh, uh, organization. I shared with the young man, listen, it's going to take about two hours or two or three hours for you to move through this particular intervention here. They're going to test you. They're going to interview you. But when you're all done, I want you to come back to the office and let me know how it went. His appointment was at 10 o'clock. So he shouldn't be back at my office till 1 o'clock in the afternoon. At 1030, he's standing outside my door. I said, how did you... Did you go to the, uh, the referral I set up for you? He said, yes. I said, well, how could you get here in 30 minutes? He said, I didn't stay. I left. I said, why did you leave? He said, everyone was dressed better than I was. I did not prepare him. Okay? Now think about it. If you were referred to a job training center and you walked in the door and everybody was dressed better than you were, would you stay? I wouldn't stay because I know it's stacked up against me. I did not prepare the young man for what he was about to encounter. One thing that participants love, they like a heads up. They love it when we give them information about here's what you can expect to happen when you go to that particular referral source. So we don't want to send people blindly places because we can do more harm than good on occasion. The next one, the next bullet. Alumni feedback loop or focus groups. Now, focus groups can be very powerful means of you getting information about your program from the participant side. Now, very often, we don't want to hear from the participants. We'll say, oh, listen, that's Johnny Jones. Every time he's coming here, he gives me a hot urine, you know, and I, I just, uh, you know, I, I really don't want to basically you know, have to entertain his stuff. Well, when you construct a focus group, my uh, colleague Joe Lunovitz, who's the director now, we went and co-facilitated focus groups in Brooklyn Treatment Court and got some very good information that we could plow back into the program to improve the program because, believe me, participants know the program inside out. They have a different perspective on the program than we have of the program. Well, 
in another uh, situ situation, and I'm going to mention the state's name, Missouri. Had to go to Missouri, conducted a focus group of participants in the program, and the, the open-ended question was, how can we improve the program? Are there things that we're not doing too good a job with? Are there things that we could do better? Are there needs that are not being met? You'd be surprised at the information that you get. Well, in this particular case, I go around the room. One young lady chimes in and says, my probation officer is my lifeline. If it wasn't for my probation officer, I'd be dead. She connected me with the women's clinic. I had OBGYN problems. I got them resolved as a result of her referral. Things couldn't be better. Keep going around the room. Another young lady chimes in and says, I didn't know that the program could connect you to health services like that at the women's clinic. Now, what was the difference between the two young ladies? The first young lady had a female case manager. The second young lady had a male case manager. And what that told the uh, people who are running or administering that drug court is that maybe we need to do a training for the men on women's issues. We're servicing a lot of women. We have a lot of uh, case managers who are males who may not be sensitive or may not be knowledgeable of women's health issues. So we have to conduct a training to lift their game, so to speak, around women's issues. And when you do that, clients essentially stay with the program longer because the program has something that they want. It has health, and, uh, uh, health services that are made available to them. And the last bullet you see there, analyze data. And that's where our researcher evaluator comes in. That person can tell you the nuts and bolts of your program. Who are you doing a good job with? Who are you doing a not so good job with? Who are you, uh, uh, which programs are servicing which participants best? You want to make the best possible match. So as a part of cultural proficiency, we like to analyze data. Well. At this point, I can't take credit for the quotation that is up at the top of the slide. You see it there in quotations. You can't do the same thing to everybody and expect the same results. Now, this is stolen. I just have to put it out there. This is stolen from Carson Fox and Carolyn Harden at a coordinator training in Dallas where they have placards made up that basically say you can't do the same thing to everybody and expect the same results. And as a trainer, I'm very sensitive to where do they position those messages. They put them at either end of the stage, so no matter where you're sitting in the room, you can read that particular slide. Because it's such an important point. Everybody is not alike. You can't have the same sanctions and incentives for the men as you do for the women. You can't have the same sanctions and incentives for your 50-year-old participants as opposed to your 25-year-old participants. You have to be a little bit more targeted than that. So what we'd like you to do is be able to, by becoming culturally proficient, we want you to recognize differences. And remember, it's not right or wrong. It's just different. All right? And we want you to be able to interpret behavior accurately. We have a habit of interpreting behavior. We put it through our own cultural lens, unaware of the participants' culture. And again, how behavior is driven perhaps in a different direction uh, as a result of them being uh, a member of that particular culture. OK. What I want to do now, there's an expression that says, if you want to be uh, culturally proficient, you have to know about your own culture and how your own culture has impacted on your behavior. And at this point, I'm going to ask Diana, is going to launch another poll. And we're going to poll on three particular items. One, eye contact. And so let's just do eye contact first and just hold up a second, Diana. With eye contact, it's always the context of the eye contact that's most important. Give you an example. 
personal example. When I was a young man and going to school, if I messed up in school and I went home, my mother would want to talk to me about it. And what would she say? She would say to me, well, you better look at me when I talk to you. Okay? Wait till your father gets home. So I internalized that message. My, as my mother's talking to me, I'm looking at her directly in the eye. Now, when my father gets home, he's there to do follow-up. So essentially, she, gives, she debriefs him on what happened. Then he says, young man, I want to talk to you. All right, we go in the other room. Dad is talking to me. And what does Dad say to me? Dad says to me, now I remember what Mom said to me about looking people in the eye when they talk to you. So I'm looking my, at my father in the eye. What does my father say to me? Boy, you better not look at me like that. So I get two completely different messages from my parents. A lot of this has to do with uh, who's giving the message, who's reading the eye contact. Okay? So what I'd like you to know, well, when Diana launches this poll, as far as eye contact is concerned, were you given a message to, to look people in the eye? If so, indicate yes. If you were given the message, don't look people in the eye, indicate no. And we'll give you about 30 seconds just to poll yourself on eye contact. And it's all about you, and there is no right or wrong answer. It's just that different cultures handle the eye contact issue very differently. All right, we'll give you another 15 seconds there. And, oh, look at this. I'm looking at this every, I got 100%. Of the people indicated yes, they were instructed to look people directly in the eye. Well, you know, I think that some of that has to do with the profession that you're working in right now. Okay? Uh, what does Judge Ju I'll use a pop icon right now before we move on to the other items. What does Judge Judy say? Judge Judy says, look at me. Look at me, because in the criminal justice system, we like people, if we're working in that system, we like people to look us in the eye when we ask them a question. That way we feel more comfortable that they're telling the truth. Oh, well, look at that. Things changed. It's now 88% indicated yes, they were given the message to look people directly in the eye, and 13% of you indicated that you were given the message, don't look people directly in the eye. So there's a minority and a majority there. Very good, very good. Uh, you probation officers out there, you, when you ask somebody a question, you like people to look you directly in the eye. But if you're in a gang and you look somebody directly in the eye, that can, that can mean a whole other thing altogether. If you have been, spent time in prison, now this is important for you folks who are entertaining reentry courts. Because prison culture is a separate culture. You look at somebody directly in the eye, you're sending a message that you may not want to send. Okay? And if you don't look somebody in the eye, what might individuals suspect of you? You're sneaky. You're a snitch. Okay? Something negative. Okay, let's do a poll on the next item now. Uh, and this is basically around decision-making. Were you given instructions to make decisions around individual needs? Or do we take into consideration the family welfare? Is it individual focus or is it family focus? And let me just share a, a short story with you to help you uh, uh, poll this particular item. We had a, uh, a colleague in Rhode Island who's a Latina. She gets a full scholarship to Columbia University to get her MSW. When we heard this, we said, we know she's going to take it. That's a fantastic opportunity. And we just said, that's a no-brainer. She's going to take it. But she did not take it right away. Why? In her culture, decisions are made from a family welfare focus. She had, she had a role in her family. She made sure her younger siblings got up, went to school, had something to eat. 
She did the laundry on the weekend. She did the shopping. She made sure her mom made her, her uh, medical appointments. So she could just not get up and leave and go to Columbia University to take advantage of this fantastic opportunity. She had to go home and talk it over with the family. Many of the individuals that you are working with currently in drug court come from cultures where they make decisions from a family focus. They look at the family welfare, what's going to be good for the group. So what I'd like to know right now, and Diana's going to poll you on this, were you uh, directed to make decisions based on individual needs or family welfare needs? And we'll give you 30 seconds to complete that particular poll. Oh, look at this. Okay, well, uh, I'm going to count you down now. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Okay. And what does my polling say? Oh, well, look at this, Diana. 25% of the individuals in the audience indicate that they were sent messages around making decisions individually. And 75% were instructed or sent messages. You make decisions and you bring into context what's best for the family. And you know what? That's very uh, consistent with the American way of life. What does the Army ad say? Be all you can be. It's individual focus. But what does the Marine ad say? Be one of the few, the proud, the brave, the selling group. So on either end of it, neither one is right or wrong, but we have both. And we ask some people in drug court to make decisions. OK, this is what's happened. Uh, what are you going to choose? You got curtain number one, curtain number two, or curtain number three. Pick one, and they just stand there, and they don't say anything. Why? Because perhaps they come from a culture where decisions are made from a group focus or a family welfare focus. So again, your responses indicate this split in people. And again, there's not a right, there's not a wrong, but just be aware that it could be both. Okay, and the last bullet we have there is on mental health. And I'm going to ask Diana to poll you on this and let me give you some background information. You just had a co-occurring trilogy that was conducted by Paul Warren. So mental health issues are going to be issues that you're going to need to process. But and because there is a stigma with mental health, very often what happens, families don't want to talk about it talk about a family member who may have a mental health issue. And it's something that is not discussed openly in the family, just not discussed at all. On the other hand, there are some families that are very open with mental health issues, and they discuss that. And you would not have a problem discussing the mental health issues of the particular uh, participant in your program with family members. So what I'd like you to do now with the poll is just indicate is it okay to talk about mental health issues? If it's okay to talk about it, check yes. If mental health issues are issues that are not discussed, check no. And we'll give you 30 seconds to vote. And we'll see what happens here. Another 15 seconds. I'm on a timer, you folks. I'm going to count you down. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Okay, let's close this poll. It said 73% of people voted. Okay, and look at what we found. 75% of you indicated, yes, it's okay 
to talk about mental health issues in the family. However, 25% of you indicated that it was something that was not discussed. And you know what? That probably is the breakout that you have amongst the participants in your program. It's probably very similar to that. And again, there's no right or wrong there. It's just a difference, and we have to acknowledge that difference. Okay, great. So now we start to see how culture has impacted on our own behavior in these three particular ways. Okay. At this point, if we're going to have a conversation about culture, we have to have a what we call a trainer definition or a working definition. And this culture means different things to different people, so it's difficult to get consensus on a definition. But we're going, I'm going to ask that you rent this definition for the hour that you spend with me because we have to have a, uh, a working definition. So culture is the things that people historically have learned to do, believe, value, and enjoy. It's the ideals, beliefs, tools, customs, and institutions into which each member of society is born. Now, a couple of things about this definition. We are not totally happy with this definition. It was very difficult to come up with a working definition or a trainer definition. The biggest problem I have with this definition, which comes out of a old Columbia University social workbook by Edgar Goldman, is the last word, born, because people belong to cultures that they're not born into. It's by our definition. Now, we've expanded our definition. So how might people identify? What cultures do people think that they will have uh, uh, available to them? Well, look at the cultures that people choose. To, uh, it's a, and this is Diana and I could probably spend a day expanding this particular slide. But this will give you a flavor for how people choose to identify culturally. I have LGBT, that's lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender. People may choose to identify culturally in that manner, and that is a culture unto itself by our definition. People may choose to identify gender-wise. I'm a liberated woman. I'm a progressive woman. Okay? They may choose to identify racially. I'm a black man. I'm going to essentially combine gender and race in my cultural definition. Ethnicity, I'm Dominican, I'm Mexican, I'm Salvadoran, I'm, uh, uh, I'm uh, from Thailand, I'm Vietnamese. Okay, so again, they may choose to identify in that manner. Class, I'm middle class, I'm upper middle class, I'm upper class. Okay, uh, age. We have Generation X, which is different from baby boomers. And if you have disparity in ages amongst the participants in your program, you can't do the same thing to everybody. That's the mantra. Professionally, people identify professionally. They may work in the criminal justice system. But talk, if, you, if you're a probation officer, talk to a probation officer who doesn't work drug court. Tell them what you do. And they may look at you funny. They will say, you mean people can come in and give you a hot urine and you don't send them to the Huskow? What is that all about? Okay, what are you running over there, a hug-a-thug program? What are you doing? I just don't get it. Okay, so there are subcultures within these professional cultures. All right, drug culture, there's a drug culture, but it's, there are many subcultures depending upon the drug of choice and the region of the country where the individual is residing. Treatment, treatment is not unified, but people may identify, I'm a therapist. Okay, they may choose to, I'm a peer educator. They may choose to identify in that manner. A veteran, we're con uh, putting together a veteran's uh, curriculum now for people who want to do veterans court. Veter there is a distinct military culture, a distinct veterans culture that revolves around, much of it revolves around disclosure. 
An individual with a military history may not want to disclose information about what happened to him while they were deployed because that may not be looked upon favorably for promotions, for getting deployed again. Okay, so you see this list. So we have a host of cultures that people may choose to identify with. And I've been given the high sign. Now, I want to end up here. Look at the cultures that collide in drug court. So you folks who are working drug court, you have to be master chefs. You've got to mix all of these cultures together to affect behavior change. We have the culture of drug abuse and addiction. What do people say on day one? They don't say, I'm going to stop using drugs. What they're internalizing is, how can I reduce the consequences of my use? I got in a tight spot. I just got to get out of here so I can get back to what I was doing. We have the culture of drug treatment. Drug treatment is not monolithic. Drug treatment providers operate very differently, but that's a good thing because we have different types of people. Therefore, we need different types of modalities and interventions. We have CBOs, that stands for community-based organizations. And we also have drug court. So all of these different cultures are coming together. And what we're going to do next time is essentially pick it up from here. All right, there was just one more slide after this. We'll pick it up from here and move forward looking at how to culturally assess our participants and look at what behaviors culture impacts on. At this time, I've been slipped a note to remind you that there's the survey that you need to fill out at the end of the session. So what will happen? We will see you seven days from now, next Wednesday, April 6th, at 1 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, same place, same station, for part two of cultural proficiency in drug court. Don't forget those surveys.